would do to have the kind of strength it takes to stand before a giant with just a sling and a stone. I remember we learned that the Mad Hatter was mad because um, it represented hatters of the time and that apparently they, the guys who made hats used mercury to turn the fur into felt and they would breathe the mercury and uh, it would cause brain damage and hence the Mad Hatter. And um, that was in the 70s and 80s that I had my young kids and I at the same time was learning that we were supposed to avoid using aluminum pots and pans because there was apparently a connection to autism. So that was the first time for me that I made any connection between heavy metals and human health. And then a few years ago, I learned that there was an unnatural amount of aluminum in the soil and that there was a program spraying aluminum and other heavy metals up into the atmosphere. And so I wanted to check it out. And that's the first way that chemtrails showed up for me. Basically, Chemtrails is a geoengineering program where airplanes fly at high altitudes and they spray chemicals into the atmosphere, including aluminum, barium, and strontium. And then those metals fall to the ground and they land in our bodies, on the soil, in our trees, in our food, and in our water. Many people confuse chemtrails with the normal jet contrails. The difference is that the uh, normal jet contrails actually dissipate within minutes while the heavy metals in the chemtrails cause those trails to persist for hours. And um, it's not a hypothetical thing. There are 32 states that already have legislation that's related to weather modification. The uh, U.S. agencies that are documented to be involved in it include the U.S. Air Force, the um, National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, the U.S. Department of the Interior, the National Science Foundation, and um, you know I, I know China boasted about um, using cloud seeding and weather uh, changing uh, before the 2008 Olympics in order to keep the opening ceremony dry. So that this is happening is completely documented. It's just that you have to know where to look because it's not talked about on mainstream weather reports. And um, this is where it gets controversial. And it's, it's kind of weird because even though it's factual that there are metals in the atmosphere and factual that those metals are falling to the ground, um, when you acknowledge that or question the legitimacy or the legality or the safety or the morality, it becomes controversial. And really, that's sad because if you're questioning something that has such major impact on us and on future generations and on our planet, it seems to me that it should be one of the most natural and encouraged parts of life and education. June 28th. 2014 and you can see there's a chemtrail all the way across the sky and then all the way this way and this is a break in the clouds this is the first break that we've had all day and over here are nothing but rain clouds thunder clouds it's been thundering and you can see these are lower clouds so whenever there's a break you can see that they're spraying above you if you listen carefully, you can hear the thunder. What's those streaks up in the sky? The ones that slowly go away. The chemtrails burn it and they're here to stay. The government spreads us every day. They call corrupt science weather engineering when it's really mass murder that they're rearing. Toxic metal sprayed in the sky while the government tells us they're both face lies. Michelle Obama did, and now people are not using the word bossy. She, that, she said that is a covert insult to women, so I'm going to tell you not to use it, which of course is bossy. That archetype of a Jezebel spirit. By the way, this is a sad issue. I've always thought Michelle Obama looked like something was wrong with her. They talk about how beautiful she is. She looks profanely scary and monstrous to me. And she always wears these weird fluffy things around her waist. 
and her shoulders are uh, wide enough to put three men's heads on. And of course, you know the classic thing of a male. You could have three heads on a male's shoulders and only another head on a woman's shoulder or one half of a head on each side. That's a well-known thing in anatomy. And I saw a online video that I may air today, and we may look into this, uh, talking about Michelle Obama looking like a man and how they only release photos of her with her hands up, covering her shoulders, or her turned at an angle. And I started looking at it with Joan Rivers saying she's a transvestite. And I'd been hearing this for years, and I thought, come on. I know Obama was raised by a transvestite and the rest of it, and I'm not getting into bashing people. That's not my cup of tea. But I started to really, last night, look at videos of this and look at photos of her in the official White House photo, and she looks like an NBA center. I mean, she looks more like Shaquille O'Neal than a black woman. And knowing all the weirdness and that we don't even know who Obama really is and his social security numbers don't e-verify, and then his dad clearly, we sell the documentary, uh, Dreams of My Real Father, and I mean, it's him with the famous pornographer who lived in Hawaii, who his grandfather was best buddies with and who Obama would stay the summers with a famous communist pornographer. And you look at the guy, it's Obama's dad. So the whole Kenya thing with her saying, my husband's from Kenya, we visited his place of birth in multiple videos in 2006 and seven. His Harvard Review, where he was the head of the Harvard Law Review, and he said, I was born in Kenya in his bio, and in his bio for shopping book deals when he was a senator, state senator said, I was born in Kenya. And we, and we took that bait hook, line, and sinker, folks. That, oh, my God, they're covering up the records. Oh, he's from Kenya, but his dad looks nothing like him. And then you see Frank Marshall Davis. I mean, it's his daddy. And then his grandfather's best buddies with him in the CIA. And then you go, oh, my gosh. And then imagine the joke. See, it's all about a joke on us that he's got cutout daughters, look nothing like him, and a cutout wife. And I began to look at his daughters last night and look at his wife. She's either she's has that double chromosomal disorder where women are really men. And, and it's turned out a lot of the Olympic runners and a lot of the top uh, tennis players and, 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 and things really are not even really females. They have the they're not hermaphrodites. Some of them are hermaphrodites or both. A lot of them have this double chromosome. Men can have it, too. And the Olympics are looking at trying to ban this in men and women because men are like supermen. They're like cavemen. And then the women are like men when they have this chromosome. I remember disorder. seeing documentaries about it and reading books about it and biology, reading about it. But it's a big issue in the Olympics. They talk about it on ESPN where they go and they do blood tests on, you know, female runners and folks that don't look like women. And, hey, it turns out they don't have a penis, excuse my French, but that's the word. That's the medical word for it. Uh, but they do have male male genetics. They're men. They're men. And it turned out. Remember the Russians couldn't lose in the sixties and seventies and eighties, and the and the women weightlifting didn't really look like women, and they would test them, and 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 you know they didn't have steroids in them, but they looked like men. Well, they were men. It's not about justice, it's not about agenda, it's not about mobilizing people, it's about dialing for corporate dollars. These two parties have sold the U.S. government and the American people to the highest bidders. The United States of America is a terrorist base of operations. The United States of America is a friend to their evil plans. We are barbaric criminals joined in this operation by our staunch friend, Great Britain. The United States of America is an enemy to the starving and suffering men and women and children of Afghanistan. This military action is a part of our campaign against a billion worldwide who practice the Islamic So many things are going on in the atmosphere. You know, chemical spraying, of course, the chemtrails. Dane Wigington, he owns a 1,600-acre wildlife preserve next to Lake Shasta in California and has investigated all levels of geoengineering. Dane, welcome. How are you? Good, George. Thanks for giving me the chance to uh, address this uh, issue in depth. Uh, thankfully, people are waking up to this issue, and it's getting more serious by the day. When, when we hear the word geoengineering, what does that mean, Dave? Yeah, most people have never even heard that term. And, and the term basically, George, means that uh, to try to engineer the climate on a global scale. And indeed, uh, 
that that is going on. All available data indicates that without reasonable doubt. Do you think the pilots, those who are spraying, know what they're spraying? Yes and no. In the case of military pilots, we, we certainly believe they would know what they're involved with more so than any commercial pilots. And many ask, you know, are commercial carriers involved with this? But there's data online, for example, Project Cloverleaf, that indicate a program outline for non-profitable commercial routes to be kept in the air uh, for use in these programs. And indeed, commercial carriers have been identified from the ground leaving a particulate trail. Again, this is not a condensation trail, but a particulate trail. Um, and uh, those carriers, you know, certainly appear to be involved, but we, we don't believe any commercial pilots or personnel would have any idea what's going on with these planes. Based on the data we've found so far, uh, these systems would be automated and, and probably not involving uh, direct knowledge of commercial pilots. Now, the, the residue that comes from the traditional contrails, which is, of course, the vapor discharge coming off of a jet, normal, can they hurt you at all? In comparison with an intentional payload disbursement, George, a, a big difference, and, and this is a big argument with people, is it a contrail, is it, is it a chemtrail, and again, chemtrail being the layman's term for geoengineering, but people should consider things, for example, if, if, if you're in a very cold day, you're walking down the street, your breath is condensing uh, as you go, you don't look behind you and see a trail stretching out for the last mile and expanding and covering the, the horizon. And again, NOAA's original data for a naturally occurring, quote, condensation trail was 70 below and 70 percent humidity. They've since scrubbed that from the net, just like they do after a nuclear accident. They, they suddenly change the, quote, safe levels and up them by 10,000 percent. So, you know, the science is uh, completely flexible when it comes to governmental agencies, but these these trails that we see that linger and cover the sky to such a degree, George, that now global dimming, another term people aren't familiar with probably, uh, is estimated right now to be 20%. That means 20% of the sun's direct rays are no longer reaching the surface of the planet. There's a hell of a lot of metal up there, oh and gosh. we know that for a fact from our testing. Today is August 14th, 2014. If you look at the video right below this one, you'll see that I filmed a, a very a chemtrail. And you can see how it now almost looks like a cloud. This would definitely deceive our children to where they just think that's clouds. So I, I showed you the film of the chemtrail, and you can see it in the distance, how it's really starting to look like a cloud. This is after about 20 minutes of me filming the, the video right before this one, or right after it. So take a look at both of them, and you'll see that this is planes spraying trails that eventually turn into clouds that eventually rain down upon us and the government will not tell us what kind of chemicals are in this stuff so this short video is yet more compelling proof of the aerosol crimes occurring in our skies day in and day out you can see this aircraft clearly turning on and off a sprayed disbursement the cobweb type clouds in the background the hazy looking particulate clouds that are created from these aircraft, yet more proof of earlier spraying going on. It's up to all of us to help sound the alarm. Each and every one of us needs to arm ourselves with credible data and help raise awareness. Every day Suffocation! Extermination! Intoxication! Tribulation! Human rights violation! And devastation! Country! paying 18% interest on something that cost twelve fifty, And they didn't like it when they got it home anyway. Not too bright, folks. Not too fucking bright. But if you talk to one of them about this, if you isolate one of them, you sit them down rationally, and you talk to them about the low IQs and the dumb behavior and the bad decisions, right away they start talking about education. That's the big answer to everything. Education. They said we need more money for education. We need more, more, more books, more teachers, more classrooms, more schools. Uh, we need more testing for the kids. You say to them, well, you know, we've tried all of that and the kids still can't pass the test. They say, oh, don't you worry about that. We're going to lower the passing grades. And that's what they do in a lot of these schools now. They lower the passing grades so more kids can pass. More kids pass, the school looks good, everybody's happy, the IQ of the country slips another two or three points, and pretty soon all you'll need to get into college is a fucking pencil. 
Got a pencil? Get the fuck in there. It's physics. <laughs> then everyone wonders why 17 other countries graduate more scientists than we do. Education. Politicians know that word. They use it on you. Politicians have traditionally hidden behind three things. The flag, the Bible, and children. No child left behind. No child left behind. Oh, really? Well, it wasn't long ago you were talking about giving kids a head start. Head start, left behind. Someone's losing fucking ground here. <laughs> but there's a reason. There's a reason. There's a reason for this. There's a reason education sucks. And it's the same reason that it will never, ever, ever be fixed. It's never going to get any better. Don't look for it. Be happy with what you got. Because the owners of this country don't want that. I'm talking about the real owners now. The big, re the wealthy, that, the real owners, the big wealthy business interests that control things and make all the important decisions. Forget the politicians. They're, they're, they're an irrelevant. The politicians are put there to give you the idea that you have freedom of choice. You don't. You have no choice. You have owners. They own you. They own everything. They own all the important land. They own and control the corporations. They've long since bought and paid for the Senate, the Congress, the state houses, the city halls. They got the judges in their back pockets. And they own all the big media, media news, all the big media companies, so they control just about all of the news and information you get to hear. They got you by the balls. They, they spend billions of dollars every year lobbying, <laughs> lobbying to get what they want. Well, we know what they want. They want more for themselves and less for everybody else. But I'll tell you what they don't want. They don't want a population of citizens capable of critical thinking. They don't want well-informed, well-educated people capable of critical thinking. They're not interested in that. That doesn't help them. That's against their interest. That's right. You know something? They don't want people who are smart enough to sit around the kitchen table to figure out how badly they're getting fucked by a system that threw them overboard 30 fucking years ago. They don't want that. You know what they want? They want obedient workers. Obedient workers. People who are just smart enough to run the machines and do the paperwork and just dumb enough to passively accept all these increasingly shittier jobs with the lower pay, the longer hours, the reduced benefits, the end of overtime, and the vanishing pension that disappears the minute you go to collect it. And now they're coming for your social security money. They want your fucking retirement money. They want it back so they can give it to their criminal friends on Wall Street. And you know something? They'll get it. They'll get it all from you sooner or later because they own this fucking place. It's a big club, and you ain't in it. <laughs> you and I are not in the big club. And by the way, it's the same big club they used to beat you over the head with all day long when they tell you what to believe. All day long, beating you over the head in their media, telling you what to believe, what to think, and what to buy. The table is tilted, folks. The game is rigged. And nobody seems to notice. Nobody seems to care. Good, honest, hard-working people, white collar, blue collar, doesn't matter what color shirt you have on. Good, honest, hard-working people continue. These are people of modest means. Continue to elect these rich cocksuckers who don't give a fuck about them. They don't give a fuck about you. They don't give a fuck about you. They don't care about you at all, at all, at all. Man, you know? And nobody seems to notice, nobody seems to care. That's what the owners count on, the fact that Americans will probably remain willfully ignorant of the big red, white, and blue dick that's being jammed up their assholes every day. <laughs> because the owners of this country know the truth. It's called the American dream, because you have to be asleep to believe it. And is the Mormon movement. The Mormon movement. Now, where did they come from? Well, the angel... Moroni is the one who gave this message to Joseph Smith. And there is Joseph Smith, the prophet of the New Age movement, and following him we have Brigham Young. Now who were these gentlemen? Now according to the source over here, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, uh, Mormonism, its founder Joseph Smith was a high-level Freemason. His successor Brigham Young was also another high Freemason, and according to the book Black Robe, Brigham Young was an intimate friend of Peter de Smet, one of the most powerful American Jesuits of the 19th century. So whenever there's something weird, you look for a, a Jesuit. And he received this light, and uh, let's ask him whether he was a Freemason. Joseph Smith, were you a Freemason? He writes in his history of the church, he's saying this, 
In the evening, I received the first degree in Freemasonry in the Nauvoo Lodge, assembled in my general business office. I was with the Masonic Lodge and rose to the sublime degree. So was he a 33 degree Freemason, yes or no? Yes, he says so himself. So we know his theology. And we know that there must be a link with the occult arm, the esoteric arm of the beast power. And Dismet is our key. Now, these are all front organizations to bring about a change in mankind and to perform particular functions. Now, the function of this organization, which as you can see, has particular hand signals, wears aprons, has the regalia of Freemasonry in its religious rituals, again, give us this idea that here is some occult activity. This is their main center in Salt Lake City. Their churches, just like um, Masonic temples, don't have windows. They are in darkness. You're not allowed into their churches unless you are initiated into the ceremony. They have the all-seeing eye, the hand of fellowship of Freemasonry right on top of their main door. They have the inverted pentagrams, former witch, mason, mormon, satanist, Bill Schnurbel writes that the magician, the inverted pentagram, has one use only and that is to call up the power of Satan. So these people know what they're all about. And uh, upside down pentagrams all over the place, plus the symbols of the sun, moon, star, uh, the all-seeing eyes, the circles with the dots in them, uh, the hexagrams, which have nothing to do with Judaism, unless you can show me in the Bible that David carried a star, which he didn't. And, of course, the Aaronic priesthood. You see? Here is their statue outside of Christ giving this Aaronic priesthood to the Mormons. The restoration of the Aaronic priesthood. Now, if you know your Bibles, then you know there's no such thing as the restoration of the Aaronic priesthood, because that was a type, and type met anti-type, and kissed at the cross. There is only one high priest today, and he serves in a temple not made by human hands. Correct? So any temple we want to build on earth is a counterfeit finish. Because our worship is upwards, not downwards. So this is not from God. This is another priesthood. Both Masonry and Mormonism refer to the Melchizedek priesthood. In Scottish Rite Masonry, the 19th degree is called the Grand Pontiff. It is during this ceremony that the candidate is anointed with oil, is made and proclaimed a priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. <laughs> what would you call that? I would call it blasphemy. Because there is only one priest who is of the order of Melchizedek and that is Jesus Christ the righteous one. No one else. So here people are making themselves Christ. So here again you have the inerrant divinity of man exalting itself over the word of God. You see, Jesus says every knee will bow. These people do not want to bow because they are gods in themselves. But on the outside, the outer portico of the temple, it is magnificent. You watch the Mormon choir it is the most beautiful choir in the world. Yes or no? Yes. Absolutely. And they sing the songs of Jesus. This is, this is wonderful. It's the most marvelous thing. And people say, well, this must be from God. No, it is not. It is not from God. You can just read their statements. Yet the pomp and the glamour that they have and the money, where does all this money come from? Well, let's look at the Mormon doctrine. Here's section 27, Doctrine of Covenants. Adam was God. Well, you have the same story as Kenneth Copeland gave last night. Some sins are atoned for by own blood only. Salvation by works. 
Jesus was born in Jerusalem, that's a minor. Christ was married to Mary, Martha, and others. Journal of Discourses, Volume 2, page 81 and 82. Well, you know, they have to justify the problem that they have there, so why not just put that in over there? <laughs> One of the most pernicious doctrines, this is Joseph Smith writing himself, one of the most pernicious doctrines ever advocated by man is the doctrine of justification by faith alone, which has entered into the hearts of millions since the days of the so-called Reformation. Well, that's what I would expect from a Jesuit to write something like that, wouldn't you? There it is. Then in 2 Nephi 2, 22 to 25, Adam fell that men might be and men are that they might have joy. So Adam fell so that man might have joy. That's glorifying sin. Uh, Sterling Stowe, was a member of the first quorum of the 70s, stated in the church section, under Christ, Adam yet stands as head. Adam fell, but he fell in the right direction. He fell towards the goal. Adam fell, but he fell upward. Jesus says to us, come up higher. So this is another Jesus. This is not my Jesus. Definitely not mine. Brigham Young went further. He wrote in the Doctrine of Covenants, the devil told the truth about Godhead. I do not blame Mother Eve. I would not have her miss eating the forbidden fruit for anything. Through the gift of sin, humanity can achieve Godhood. Do you pick up the same doctrine everywhere? Are we getting sort of, you know, au okay fait with it? You were also in the beginning with the Father. Man was also in the beginning with God. Intelligence or light of truth was not created or made, neither indeed can be. So there you have all these statements. In the Mass, the fault is also exalted because the Catholic Mass has this statement, O oh, blessed fault. So the fault is exalted. Then you have all kinds of occult symbols like the bee and the hive and the, all the keys and cosmic keys, all these symbols. You can read it in the two Babylons. Now, there is some truth in the matter that occultism today is controlled by elite families. And, uh, of course, the Mormon movement is the one that maintains a register of every single human being in the world. That's their job for the inner order. So if you want to know where you come from, you go into the Mormon computer, it'll tell you who your great-grandfather was all the way back to Adam. Now, they had a chart against the wall because uh, President Bush had been elected, so they had his family tree, which was fascinating. So I photographed it. This is the Howland family chart. Now you tell me whether this is coincidence. So the great, 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 great grandfather of the president up there was also the great, great grandfather of Joseph Ira Earl, Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon movement. So he's related to George W. Bush. Emma Hale, Winston Churchill, was related. Franklin D. Roosevelt, Richard Nixon, President Ford, President George Bush Sr., President George Bush Jr. Coincidence? It's stretching it, right? Stretching it. If you want to be in the space program and get anywhere, you either be a Mormon or a Mason. Because there's no difference between the two, actually. It's exactly the same. I photographed President Ford signing himself as a 33 degree Freemason there in the Masonic Lodge. One of them into which I managed to sneak. So there it is. Evidence in his own handwriting on his own picture. And the Scottish Rite um, calendar will give you all of these names and will tell you that the mega cosmonauts and, and astronauts of the world are all in a circle. Uh, Mason, so all the space ones, whether you talk about Colonel John Glenn or any one of them, in the presidential galleries of the Masonic lodges, all the presidents are listed. The last ones are always left out. They will be added in future years. 
So here's another movement giving itself a Christian flavor which has nothing to do with Christianity but uses mysticism. Now the New Age was the journal that uh, Freemasonry used to give out. But then you know they were linked to the New Age so they changed the name to Scottish Rite Journal. Here are some of the books that are paramount in telling us what occultism is about. Of course Blavatsky's secret doctrine is very very important. I briefly want to just say something about Jehovah's Witnesses as well. You know what I like about Jehovah's Witnesses? Their sincerity. They're so sincere and uh, we're always scared when they knock on the door. Not me. I love it. I invite them in. Always. Please come in. Because it's, it's an ev evangelistic opportunity. Jehovah's Witnesses. Here's their original writing. Notice that they have the divine plan of the ages. There they have the symbol of the god Ra on it. Now that should make you a little bit nervous. This is an original watchtower. I photographed it directly from the watchtower. 1916 December 1. It has the symbol of the Knights Templars on it. Now that links it to masonry. And here is the death is described of Brother Russell. And we see the entire explanation of how in his death situation he had to be robed with a robe and toga so that he could die a Masonic death in the watchtower. Now these poor people need perhaps to know where their organization hails from. Notice that all of them, all of them have something to do with Jesus. This organization makes Jesus less than he is in the Bible. And that should make us nervous. On his grave you also have the Knights Templar symbol. These are all the unfulfilled predictions that they have. They predicted, for example, the coming of Christ, 1874, the resurrection, 1878, the close of the favor of the Gentiles, 1914, Armageddon, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob would be resurrected in 1915, uh, the churches would be destroyed in 1918, the kingdom established in 1925, and then 1950, and by the way, in 19, after 1925, you could call up Abraham in Jerusalem and ask him to resurrect your, your brethren. Uh, the New World Bible, all of these interesting things. Here is their own writing concerning the times of the Gentiles. We consider it an established truth that the final end of the kingdoms of the world and the full establishment of the kingdom of God will be accomplished by the end of AD 1914. And sometime before the end, uh, the last member of the day's body of Christ will be glorified. Now none of these things came true and the Bible says, well, then don't worry about it. But what is the occult connection? You see, as long as millions of people in many, many sub-organizations can be brought to think that Jesus is less than the Bible says he is, then occultism achieves its aim. Because they have to eventually unite on a Christ that satisfies them all. Oh. So the more organizations you have that make Jesus less than he is and man more than he is, the more likely they are to achieve it. Now, in occultism they use subliminals. So if you go to Jehovah's Witnesses um, journals, the Watchtower for example, they use subliminals. Here in this picture, demonic faces in the hand. This is called the lion's paw grip. This is a Masonic handshake for lifting up uh, individuals. If you look at this drawing, it looks pretty innocuous there in the watchtower. If you turn it and you look a little bit closer, then you'll see hidden in the wood you have the goat's head uh, of hidden in the tree. If you turn some of these pictures around, you will see demonic faces hidden in the hair and uh, they'll use keys, they'll use high occult symbols like the one with the finger just slightly removed. Try and remember that one where the little finger is just slightly removed from the side. That's a high occult uh, key symbol. They use Roman keys and they use uh, Masonic subliminals like this angel. If you look at him carefully, 
the one foot is a goat's foot and then he has the, the Masonic triangles and the pentagrams hidden in it and this lady over here has a picture of the deity hidden subliminally in her dress. Anybody see it? Once you see it, you see it. If you don't see it, you don't see it. That's a subliminal. So you really have to look. Well, let's make it a little bit bigger. Can you see it now? Where is it? It's down there, right? Can you recognize the face? All right. If you still can't recognize it, let me give you who it is. There it is. It's that one. Now who's that? That's Zeus. That's the head of the gods. That's the symbol of Lucifer. All right. Fascinating Press stuff. Here, guys. And, uh, the information that I'm about to go over in this video is very disturbing. So, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, I'm sorry. I'm sure many of you have seen people in your uh, social media news feed. And, you know, people all around the world uh, dumping ice buckets on their head. And this is all to raise awareness and to raise money for ALS, which uh, is also known as Lou Gehrig's disease. And on the surface, this is, you know, a good cause, uh, you know, on the surface. That's the key here. But I'm going to prove that there's a lot more t to what's going on. And I believe that this is a satanic ritual. Yeah, I said it. A satanic ritual because it actually involves embryonic stem cell research, which actually uh, consists of uh, aborted fetuses. That's what embryonic stem cell research is. They use these cells from aborted fetuses to uh, conduct research and, um, you know, it allegedly goes to a good cause, but anything that involves dead babies uh, <laughs> isn't good, in my opinion. And I'm going to go into the details here and prove to you, scientifically, that this is what's going on, okay? And before I get into any of the science behind the stem cell research, I just want to say this. Abortion... Okay, the whole uh, idea of abortion, it, it's not about women's rights or the right to choose. It's about uh, s sacrifice, okay? That's what it's about. It's about the sacrificial uh, blood of virgins. And we know this because the whole abortion initiative, you know, Planned Parenthood and stuff like that, was funded and backed by these rich elitists, uh, people like the Rockefellers, right? Uh, these are people that despise humanity and enslave us all throughout history, these bloodlines... Uh, have been doing this and this stems back all the way to the ancient world with the elites uh, forcing uh, their their um, peasants and stuff to sacrifice the virgins the the firstborn and, and this that and the other it's a blood sacrifice um, and it's it's just a way of uh, spiritually draining uh, humanity by by forcing us to give our young up to to the to them okay that that's what the elites are about right they're about it's about power and domination. So um, back to the stem cell thing here. Um, abortion foes say stem cell research is unnecessary. So yes, um, stem cell research does require cells from aborted fetuses. Okay, all right. So so this is uh, stem cell research in general is a way to pay homage to abortion, which is a way to pay homage to the elites through blood sacrifice of virgins. Again, and ALS. Here's where I get into the more scientific stuff. Okay. This article out of NBC News, published just a few days ago, goes into the fact that, that the ALS Association is helping pay for a study of people with an inherited form of ALS to see whether a drug that targets the mutated SOD1 gene responsible will help, okay? A company called ISIS, right, is developing the drug, and as many of you might already know, ISIS is an ancient Egyptian goddess that uh, many of these elites to this very day like to worship, okay? And again, the Egyptians back then, they would sacrifice their young to, to the gods as well, okay? It was blood, it's all blood sacrifice of, of virgins, quote-unquote. And as you can see here in this MDA slash ALS news magazine, right? Mainstream publication updates on several important clinical trials were presented at an international ALS conference in December, including reports on ISIS... Uh, dash SOD1 RX uh, neural stem cells and again the name of the gene is SOD1 so there you go um, a mutated SOD1 gene responsible will help the company developing it is called ISIS and this is the name of the drug uh, we got the name of the company in the drug as well and the gene okay so this is what it is and it's from neural stem cells which of course as I said <laughs> are derived from uh, aborted fetuses Okay, so this whole thing, this whole thing, all right, this ice bucket challenge, 
everybody's being tricked into it, okay? Everybody's being tricked to pay homage to this virgin sacrifice, okay? Uh, to abortion, to stem cell research, to this uh, ALS research involving the SOD1 gene and a company called, conveniently called, ISIS. Am I right? <laughs> I mean, come on. Guys, this th this is unbelievable. And when I first did the research into this, right, when I first read this article, I was blown away that this is actually happening. I, I am literally blown away, okay? And it even says here in Max Resistance, uh, in this article, um, I guess the person that initially wrote it, a blogger named Renny Medeiros, um, said they knew an ex-Satanist friend that participated in this uh, ritual that involved an ice bucket uh, challenge type thing. And this had nothing to do with ALS. So I guess uh, this ice bucket thing, in general, even without paying homage to, to uh, the virgin sacrifice, uh, abortion and stuff... I guess in itself, it's a satanic ritual anyway. Um, I mean, I've never heard of it, but uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all. I mean, um, you know, you got some of these uh, paganists, evil paganists, um, that use this fire and ice type philosophy, you know, water, air, earth, fire and stuff. Um, and of course, I know some people that, that are involved in that kind of stuff too, that, that are good people, but there's very evil people as well that that uh, tend to worship these uh, elements, as they call them, ice, fire, water, whatever. Um, so it wouldn't surprise me at all. Um, and it's also worth noting that uh, Corey Griffin, the kid who started this ice bucket challenge in Nantucket, Massachusetts, actually died at age 27, which is an occult number. Uh, a lot of these uh, famous musicians died at age 27, and allegedly, possibly, many of them could have been uh, ritual sacrifices as well. Um, you know, that's all about perspective. But, but yeah, this kid Corey Griffin died at 27 as well, and uh, you know, he just so happened to die when this whole thing was going viral a couple well, weeks ago. But the you know? number of chromosomes also has a factor involved in the complexity of the organism. Penicillin has two chromosomes. So when a penicillin divides or grows, it only has two chromosomes that have to unwind, split, copy themselves, and wind back together. Which, of course, requires a lot of energy for this to happen also. And that's another whole long system on how the Michael Behe's book, on Darwin's Black Box, explaining the complexity of the cell is really amazing. Uh, well worth reading. But fruit flies have eight chromosomes. So I put these animals and plants and things in order as a spoof to make fun of the evolution theory. How that, you know, the more complex you get, the more you evolve. And how penicillin evolved first and slowly turned into a fruit fly. And over millions of years, got some more chromosomes and became either a tomato or a house fly. They're twins, you know. Nobody can tell the difference between a tomato and a house fly. They both have 12 chromosomes. This would be the, like the number of instruction manuals to build that organism. A tomato and a house fly, same number of chromosomes. Hmm. Does that prove anything? Slowly it evolved into a pea, of course, with 14 chromosomes, and then I'd add the numbers up. This is, these are the actual number of chromosomes found in these organisms. Now, possums, redwood trees, and kidney beans all have 22. Proving, of course, you know, they're twin, identical triplets this time, you know, closely related. Most people can't tell the difference between a possum, a redwood tree, and a kidney bean. Average scientists can't, that's for sure, because they're, you know, obviously identical. And then slowly, over millions of years, we evolved enough chromosomes and finally became a human. Humans have 46. What happens if a human gets extra chromosomes? Anybody know what that's called? Sometimes kids are born with 48 chromosomes. Really? Down's syndrome. Oh. Fungaloid. Extra, extra pair of chromosomes. Is it advantageous? No. It's a disadvantage. 46 chromosomes. Now, if we can just get two more chromosomes, we should be a tobacco plant. They have 48. They're, they're way ahead of us evolving. And you can see, obviously, tobacco and chimpanzees are, are twins, you know, identical. Um, dogs and chickens are also. They both have 78 chromosomes. Now, why would a chicken have more chromosomes than a human? And then, of course, slowly over millions of years, we got enough chromosomes to become a carp. More than twice as complex as humans. A simple carp. And a fern has 480 chromosomes. 
And some evolutionists will argue, yeah, but the number of genes is different on these things. Okay, but they're missing the entire point. Probably intentionally, they're missing the point. But this textbook, and like most textbooks you have there in front of you, will try to show the kids that DNA similarities proves some kind of relationship. Here's what they've done. You take the chromosome of a human, let's say, and there's only four types of base pairs. I think they label them A, D, uh, D uh, I used to know the names of them, I'm going blank right now. But they give them a letter. Let's call it A, B, C, D. That's not the right letters, but it's close to that. They will take the sequence. They'll say, look, a human's, the sequence, like the code, is, you know, A, B, C, D, D, A, B, A, C. And they put this long sequence of letters, okay? Then they line up the sequence of letters for a chimpanzee. And they find how many places do they match? Look at that. In the seventh column, they both got an A. Wow. And in the tenth column, they both have a B. Wow, that proves we're related. <laughs> I don't know how this logic got into there, but that's what they think. So they've compared these long sequence of letters. I guess they have nothing else to do with their grant money. And they compare these long sequence of letters and say, humans and chimpanzees are 98.2% similar. So when they say the DNA is similar, they're saying the sequence of these base pairs matched. 98% of the time. Well, Jan, you've taught English for years. I'm, I'm sure you could think up all kinds of sentences that are 98% similar. Only a few letters are different. But the sent mean, sentence means something very different. You only got to change a letter here and there to totally change a word. Nick, trying to learn English, you know how many words there are. There are only one letter different, and it's a totally different word. Very difficult. And Russian probably has the same thing, right? With different letter, different words. Look almost the same. One letter's different. Means something totally different. We ought to go through. Somebody maybe could do that. Is get a, make a sentence or a paragraph that is 98% similar. But have a totally different meaning. That would be a neat uh, spoof to do. I'd like to have one to use in my seminar here. Um, does that prove they're related? Absolutely nothing. This has nothing to do with relationship. The fact that all forms of life, or all these chromosomes, have the same four base pairs is like saying, you know, and they'll say, see, that proves evolutionary relationship. I would say, now, wait a minute, you can come to my library, and you'll notice all the books in there, written in English, have only 26 basic letters. Same 26 letters used over and over and over and over again, aren't they? Does that prove they're related somehow? No. That proves that's the code you write words from. And the code you write chromosomes from is this base pair code, which proves the designer thought, you know, I'm going to make them similar so that the brown cow can eat the green grass and digest it. If each organism had its own separate code, like when I try to see the Russian words or the German or the French or the Italian as I travel around, a lot of, like Chinese, Jan, you over in China, they have a different code. They don't use any of our letters. You not, only, you not only have to learn the language, you have to learn the letters. That's where it's a little easier to learn French or Spanish. At least they've got the same letters we do in most cases, a few, you know, different. Russians, of course, make their R backwards from us, and uh, whatever that means. But the code has, has some similarities, but it also has some differences between these languages. The code for life is pretty much the same. And some have argued that's evidence of evolution. No, no, no. That's evidence that the designer made it where we can, you know, eat and digest these things. If they, if they all had different codes, it wouldn't work. Eric, if I gave you a Russian newspaper and said, I want you to cut out the letters and reassemble them and make an English sentence, you probably could do that. If I said, I want you to cut out the letters and make a whole book, well, you probably eventually are going to come across some letters that Russians don't have, that you need in English, but they don't have one available. Same thing if you're translating from Russian to English, okay? There may be some letters, I don't know which ones, that just, they don't exist. Do you have an X in Russian? Do you have an X? Do you have a right, uh, the R facing the right way, or just the backwards R? Just the backwards one, not the regular one. So you'd be hard-pressed then to make a lot of words. How many words have an R that you now cannot make? It would greatly limit your ability to write that book. Certain words you just can't use. There isn't, aren't any available. 
So if there weren't similarities of these uh, base pairs and of the amino acids and in the, in the chromosomes and the DNA structure and in the molecules and in the proteins, we couldn't digest anything else except other humans. That'd be very unhandy after a couple of generations. So they'll say, you know, orangutans are 96% similar. And the textbook shows the kids a graph here and says, see, this tells how many millions of years ago we evolved from a common ancestor. Well, that is just silly, okay? It doesn't prove we evolved from a common ancestor uh, 15 million years ago from a monkey group. It could prove we have a common designer and the same guy wrote these codes. Certain authors, when they write, they'll use certain words over and over again. And sometimes they have certain styles of writing, you know, these different authors do. But judging by that, same DNA code would prove the same engineer wrote the codes, not evolution. So why the textbooks always teach the kids this is evidence for evolution is beyond my comprehension. Either they're not capable of thinking, maybe this proves a common designer, or they're running from that designer, like Romans chapter 1 tells us. They do not want to retain God in their knowledge. And so they only see it one way. All right, we're talking about thinking critically. Would care to know my name Would care to feel my hurt Who 